I want to thank you for joining us uh, to discuss students with disabilities, substance misuse, and incarceration. Each of these alone are complicated topics. But in, in many communities, this perfect storm is raging. And the consequences of substance misuse for people with learning disabilities includes alienation and social difficulties that, that sometimes lead to incarceration. Just to be honest with you, substance misuse on its own in youth can lead to them being vulnerable to exploitation. And for those youth who are prescribed medication, the effects of stopping prescribed medication in order to drink alcohol can also cause complications. So today, we will show you that there is a strong link between substance misuse and learning disabilities. And some of you, to say, the least may be surprised. The recent research has also found that <clears throat> those with learning disabilities are at greater risk of misusing substances than their non-disabled peers. So today is an opportunity for you to learn about this hidden population and the challenges they face so we as preventionists can help them make changes. And we can help make the changes needed to deal with this issue in all of our communities. As preventionists, this is our ethical responsibility. I would like each person to put in the chat uh, what your title is or your job responsibility is so we can get a, an idea of what the audience looks like. So if you could put in there, you know, your either your title or your background or your professional, uh, your profession then that would be very helpful to us. If you could just put that in the chat, okay. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, I see the chat filling up. Community liaisons, we have a lot of preventionists in here. Program coordinators as well. Oh, some nurses. We're definitely gonna go back through this, but this is, is helpful for our facilitators today to be able to look at this and see our audience and get a, a better picture of who we have here in the room. Let's do the, do the work now. Um, this presentation was prepared uh, for the South Southwest Prevention Technology Transfer Center Network under a cooperative agreement from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. The opinions expressed herein are the views of PTTC network and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services. So no official support or endorsement of what we are saying in our opinions described in this uh, production is intended or should be inferred. Our objectives uh, for today are simple. We wanna explain the current landscape of special education in public schools as it relates to substance misuse prevention. We also wanna describe how substance misuse among students with disabilities contributes to high incarceration rates. And then we wanna identify some promising approaches to provide prevention services to students with disabilities. My name is Derek Neely, and I'm a TTA specialist for Region 6 of the PTTC. And I've been in prevention for many years, and I'm a certified prevention consultant. And even with that experience, this topic is of a special interest to me as well. Because today, we will help you understand the problem by providing an overview of the landscape young people with mental disabilities face in our education system. Understanding the risk factors will help us look at some approaches to address the school to prison pipeline and evaluate what prevention professionals can do. You see, no matter what lens you're looking through, our common goal should always be student wellness. And problems that are ignored, they do not go away. So this journey will be both enlightening and humbling. But ultimately, what you learn here and in the next session will be empowered.
Chuck Lester will lead us into this discussion today. Chuck is a dynamic and inspiring prevention professional. Chuck serves as a grant manager for OSU community wellness programs for Payne, Pawnee, Noble, Osage, and Kay counties in Oklahoma. And in this capacity, he works with local stakeholders to reduce the consequences of substance abuse across the region through the use of evidence-based environmental strategies. And for the past five years, Chuck served as the Regional Strategic Prevention Framework Coordinator. See, much of his work focused on reducing underage drinking in Payne County and included engaging retail outlets to provide regular responsible beverage sales and service training staff. Partnering with law enforcement to create special enforcement events, publicizing social laws, and piloting a responsible retailing forum project in Payne County. See, Chuck has a strong history of working directly with youth to transform communities. As the students working against tobacco or SWAT coordinator, he was responsible for recruiting, training, and sustaining SWAT groups at local schools. These student groups sought to complete anti-tobacco advocacy campaigns, such as getting their school to pass 24-7 tobacco-free policies. And during this career, he has also served as the director of a 27-acre youth residential summer camp. Quite amazing. Camp sessions were, were one week long and averaged 120 campers a week for seven weeks of the summer. So for the past 10 years, he has coordinated the SPIF SIG, a grant that seeks to solve local substance use and abuse problems through the use of strategic prevention framework model by empowering you. In short, Chuck is an inspiration to us all. And I'm honored to have him and his esteemed colleague, Dr. Warren, with us today. I pass the mic to Chuck. Thank you, Derek. It is always very, very kind, uh, probably overly so. It's a it's a pleasure um, to be here today. Although I have to tell you, um, the reason that I'm here, and, and I, I I think this is one of those things that's familiar to everybody. Have you ever ever been in the middle of a conversation, uh, maybe deep in a professional piece or even in a personal conversation, and somebody asks you a question? Um, and as soon as you have a moment to process that question, it feels like the entire room has tilted. The, the, the other way that I think about describing this is uh, when you're driving down a road, pretty straight road, and you hit a, a pretty decent sized hill and you get up to the top of it and it feels like your stomach drops out from under you. Mr. Newbie up there that just gave me that kind introduction and spoke about all the good things that I have done and uh, all of this experience that I have with youth. He dropped one of those questions on me several months ago, and that is why we are all here today. Uh, really, it'll go back to a conversation that he and his amazing colleague, uh, LaShonda, had uh, earlier. But it's important, I think, not just that we analyze this topic, but we also talk about, especially because I saw so many prevention professionals in the room, these are the conversations where we do find those hidden populations. So I've worked with youth in some capacity or another for probably most of the 25 years that I've been in some sort of professional capacity, whether that's camp or at Head Start or at whatever. And when Derek asked me a very simple question that we will absolutely address a little bit later on, it had this effect on me. I mean, it felt like the rug came completely out from under me. And I realized in that moment, as I hope that all preventionists and good preventionists do, I needed help. I did not have the answers. I felt like this was a question that I should know more about, given my experience, given my profession. I felt like it was a, a question um, and a topic that I should be more conversant on. And it turns out I just, I just needed help. So... I reached out. Um, I leveraged some of those contacts like we know we need to do. I reached out to uh, my colleague here at OSU Community Wellness, Melinda Caldwell, who's a brilliant frontline preventionist um, and also a mom of a child with a disability. Um, and I also reached out to my 
good friend uh, for a long time, longer than I want to say, uh, Dr. Michelle Warren, who is the Director of Mental Health Services with the Osage County Interlocal Cooperative. Uh, it's a group that provides comprehensive direct school-based supports and consultation services to meet the academic, behavioral, and social-emotional needs of students in rural counties in Osage, Oklahoma. So very much on the front lines of what we're going to be talking about today. To find out, I, I needed to listen. I needed to spend some time learning and try and understand um, kind of what was going on in schools and with this hidden population that I obviously had not spent nearly enough time thinking about how our work in, com in community-based prevention can tie to this, uh, this hidden population. Um, so in the course of that, I realized I needed to get a sort of a lay of the land. And this will become important as well when we start to talk about um, the idea of triangulation, the, the sort of name of this today, of triangulating the issues. Because getting the lay of the land and understanding what our horizons are and, and how much land we can see is really what a lot of this is about. I wanted to expand my horizons in this. So I reached out to a professional so that she could give me the landscape. And when we talk about landscape, it's interesting. I, when I was looking up definitions, I feel like it's always important to make sure everybody's on the same page. One of the, the definitions that I think is really applicable today, and especially as we get in later in the program, landscape is defined as the land that can be seen in one glance, right? So we take that first look, we get the landscape, we get the picture. But importantly, we know that identity which is based on the characteristics of that landscape, the processes that take place in the landscape and the significance assigned to that landscape all sort of weave into what makes it a unique piece. So it's deeper than what we can get on first glance, but that's also why it's important for us who may not be in that setting every day to reach out to individuals who are, professionals who are, so that we can have a deeper understanding of it. So. That's a lot of me talking initially to set that up, but Dr. Warren, if you wouldn't mind uh, hopping in here and give us a little bit of the landscape um, of what is special education. We'll start there. So special education is um, programming provided to students that have been identified as having a disability who also demonstrate an educational need that requires specially designed instruction to address. Um, so when we talk about the students that are involved in special education, it, it varies dramatically from students with more mild disabilities, such as a communication um, disorder, maybe they have some articulation errors or language errors that need to be addressed, to students that have much more involved disabilities um, and require specialized programming, lots of additional staff, alternate standards and curriculum. What is the law that covers that? And what do what are schools responsible for in that? So the law that addresses special education is the Individuals with Disabilities Act. Um, commonly referred to as IDEA, and each state that receives federal funding participates um, under that law. So there's going to be a little variation as we go from state to state, um, but all of them have to fit within the confines of the federal guidelines on that. So the bare basics are, are similar across the nation. What are some of the challenges that schools have meeting that act? Uh, the challenges. So as all things in education, um, we have grand ideas. And then those grand ideas are not always fully funded or supported. Um, IDEA is one of those grand ideas that has never been fully funded since its inception in the early 70s. Um, but we still have the same obligation to meet all of the requirements within the law. Um, the other big hurdle, especially right now in the landscape that is public education is staffing. Um, 
We have nationwide shortages in Oklahoma. Our shortages are even more significant than that. Um, so finding and maintaining appropriately trained individuals to provide the level of service that these students require is a ongoing challenge. Okay. And I know I, I want everybody as well as we move to this next slide. Um, if you will for me, close your eyes. And I, all of us have probably done some work and we all have this in our head. But I, when I say to you, if your eyes are closed and we're just going to make a picture in our head, a person with a disability, what comes to mind? Everybody will have a mental image of what that looks like. And it, it's probably, sometimes it can probably be quite personal. It might be yourself, it might be somebody um, very close to you. It might be uh, a different kind of image. But when we talk about IDEA and we talk about it in schools, there are very specific categories that somebody will meet to do that. And it's probably in a lot of ways, a lot broader than that picture that you might have in your head because the picture you might have in your head may be a very specific disability, but the category or the umbrella that catches a lot of these folks can be relatively broad. Can you go over that for us? Sure. Uh, so there are 13 identified categories under IDEA, um, ranging anywhere from a speech language impairment to a student who is deaf and blind, to a student who has multiple disabilities, meaning they meet eligibility criteria for two or more um, categories. So um, from state to state, the names of those categories vary a little bit, and some of the requirements of a category might, might have some variability. Um, but statewide, I can identify those 13 categories across all, all nations, all, all states within the nation is where I was going with that. Very good. Thank you very much. Is there is there anything else as far as the challenges or the pieces that uh, go? I, I would share this because uh, I'll come back to this. Uh, Dr. Warren also shared with me on, on Monday, just as we start to transition to where substance use overlaps. Um, and I guess, well, you were there. Tell, you can tell the story. Uh, the well, case the first thing I want to highlight is that substance abuse disorders are not a category under IDEA. Um, so schools do not have a legal obligation to identify those as disabilities and or provide services for those students um, to meet that um, the symptoms of those disorders. So um, you guys working in prevention know that there's lots of comorbidity across disorders. What we commonly would see was it's a student who has a substance use disorder, probably also has another disorder that might make them eligible under IDEA, such as emotional disturbance, or um, they might have some medical issues, either prior to or as a result of those substance use disorders that are impacting their ability to access their education. Um, so uh, while students with substance use disorders might receive services under IDEA, they're directed at accessing education, not addressing their substance use issues. And importantly, before we then get to the case study, yep. um, it, we'll talk about this later, we can circle back to it, but from a prevention standpoint, there's already some work to do there. And we know that individuals and adults uh, can qualify for ADA based solely off of an SUD diagnosis, but the schools under the IDE Act have no, uh, they're not required and therefore there's not a lot going on to treat the substance abuse disorder as a thing unto itself. They can treat the symptoms, they can make a, you know exceptions for the symptoms, they can work with the, the student on that level, but the substance use disorder as a thing unto itself cannot necessarily be addressed directly. And that's important in our changing landscape, especially when we talk about substance use and misuse, because more and more states um, have legalized substances. And so we're running into issues like this one. 
So the case that Chuck is referring to, we have a um, a resource available to lots of our to all of our school districts that was really intended to support rural schools. Um, they have the it, it's a a virtual meeting to allow for some didactic training um, and opportunities to consult on cases and have questions asked and answered. So the case that was available, that was brought to our attention on Monday, happened to be very timely. Um, it was an elementary student who was eligible under IDEA. I don't remember the category, um, but that student had a medical marijuana card issued to him in the state of Oklahoma um, as a 10-year-old elementary student. Um, and the, the, the school was finding the student regularly attending school intoxicated to the point that they were not functional in the school setting. Um, and they were seeking some guidance on how to navigate that as a school district while still protecting his rights under IDEA. Um, and I noticed in the chat violations for ADA. Um, so school districts also have to follow ADA and that would be addressed through a section 504 plan if that student is eligible. Um, because there's no funding through ADA, those services tend to be about accommodation, um, things that school districts can provide to a student without specially trained staff members, special equipment, things like that. So a student might have a 504 plan for a substance use disorder, and that would be appropriate in the school setting, but would it meet the threshold of IDEA as requiring specially designed instruction? Very good. So complex, right? I mean, there's there's lots of issues here. And when we start to talk about it, one of the recommendations that came back, and this is a place, again, where prevention might have a, uh, especially that sort of environmentally based primary kind of, of helping school districts develop some policies that are more geared towards what intoxication looks like. Um, and maybe a, a student that's to a certain level um, is not there for instruction that day, or we find an in-school um, alternative. So there are some some pieces there, but I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Warren. She's going to need to jump off today. You're going to hear for a lot from more from her and Melinda in round two. So if you haven't registered for that, I'd encourage you to. Thank you very much for giving us that landscape. Again, I, I think it's important when we don't know um, to reach out to, to folks who can give it to us firsthand and try and lay it out. So thank you very much for that. Um, and as we sort of transition, one of the things after Derek asked the question and all of us started to dig in, all the prevention folks started to dig in um, to the issue at hand is it really started to become pretty prominent that even though there's these 13 categories that are very consistent across the nation, there's really two of them um, that in particular, um, students with are at the highest risk for substance use disorder. And that's emotional disturbance, which is defined as a condition exhibiting one or more of the following characteristics over a long period of time and to a marked degree that adversely affects a child's educational performance. So again, focusing on the educational outcomes. Um, any inability to learn that cannot be explained by intellectual, sensory, or health factors. An inability to build or maintain satisfactory interpersonal relationships with peers and teachers. Inappropriate types of behavior or feelings under normal circumstances. A general pervasive mood of unhappiness or depression. And finally, a tendency to develop physical symptoms or fears associated with personal or school problems. The second kind um, of broad category that's highly um, correlated with an increased risk of substance use disorder is intellectual disability. So a significantly sub-average general intellectually functioning um, existing concurrently 
with deficits in adaptive behavior and manifested during the developmental period that adversely affects a child's educational performance. Um, so those two pieces we know in general have been very strongly correlated uh, with an increased use in substance use disorders. Um, you'll notice, or you should have gotten a uh, link or a attached handout for this session um, that'll be risk factors across the lifespan. Um, if you can open that up now, we're gonna discuss that here in just a little bit. That chart um, came from SAMHSA. Uh, it's from the risk and protective factors for mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders across the life cycle. And it covers several different risk factors in the, the different sort of stages of education for, for kiddos. And we're gonna ask some questions about that. So I give you some time to go ahead and pull that up and survey those. As you do that, um, I, I wanted to also say, we decided to go across the lifespan because really going back to my time at, at Head Start, this really is one of those pieces. And we'll talk about it again when we get into some of the epidemiological data, but the earlier we can start to um, intervene on these, the better. We think a lot of times of substance misuse and, and abuse in those sort of later years. For us in Oklahoma, we have the Oklahoma Preven Prevention Needs Assessment that from sixth grade on, so sixth, eighth, 10th, and 12th graders get it every other year, we can start to know um, what their 30-day use looks like for all sorts of substances. We even, it's a, it's a really full-fledged survey that asks all sorts of things. We can even start to assess community risk factors and protective factors. But sort of at that sixth grade level, right? Some of these issues, especially IEP, um, you know, that can start as an IFSP, um, even in, in early Head Start and, and Head Start. So some of these issues that we see lead to ind individuals to have an increased risk of substance abuse disorder start well before we may be monitoring them. And sometimes, like in the case of our survey, we may not know if that individual is on an IEP or has a disability. There may not be a way for us to track that in, in prevention, which is just another thing to keep in the back of your mind is, do we even know what our use rates would look like if we wanted to pull that specific data? So you'll see in the chat, the triangulating the issue handout is there. Hopefully we've all had a chance to look at it a little bit. And as you scan those, which risk factors do you think place students with disabilities at the highest level of risk for substance misuse? So go ahead and review that list. And if you will, in the chat box, drop in what your thoughts are. Scroll to page four of the handout. Thank you very much, Wanda. So just as they come up, we've got a lack of support. Yes. Discrimination. Discrimination, very good. School system, poor attachment with parents, sensation seeking, possible alienation. Listen. Foster youth struggles with houselessness, yep. Home insecurity, peer rejection, peer rejection came up again. Wow. Bullying, parent relationships, and stigma. That's a good one. Substance use among family, stress, lack of support again, grief, death in the family. Absolutely. All of these are, are good. And we also know, right, though, that it's a complex system. A person is a very complex system, and it's likely sort of this big arrangement of these and the way that they interplay these factors that sort of lead to this. So let's take a further look at what some of our data tells us. And this gets us closer to the question that was asked, because not only are we looking at the correlation among uh, folks with who are maybe on an IEP or have a disability and their rates of substance use disorder, but eventually we're looking at how that leads folks into incarceration. Um, so this chart shows the disability prevalence among people incarcerated in state or federal prisons, um, 2016. And if you look at this, any disability, 
70% of the folks we have incarcerated identify as having some sort of disability in our federal and state prisons in 2016. A psychiatric disability was the second most common, um, almost 50%. And in non-psychiatric disabilities, the highest uh, to our attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is a common IEP that kids are on, especially in the behavioral side of things, and cognitive disabilities. Um, but even just having been enrolled at any point in time in your life in special education, more than 20% of our folks who are incarcerated in a state or federal penitentiary or, or prison system identify as, as having been disabled and been in special education. Those are huge numbers, incredibly huge numbers. And this was really one of the first graphs that I came across when Derek asked me the question that really, really acted as kind of an eye opener. Um, I, I, I would have suspected that it was high. I don't know that I would have ever thought that it would be close to 70%. Um, and, and especially as we look at, at the entire spectrum of things um, that people identify as, some of the ones that you might suspect um, just because of the severity of the, the severe mental illness, like schizophrenia or a psychotic, psychotic disorder aren't that high in compared to ADHD a cognitive disability, a mobile uh, mobility disability. Um, these are all really, it just gave me a lot to chew on and think about. That's why I said uh, I really knew that I needed some help. I needed to reach out and start to learn more about how we got here and, and what the data was telling us. So let's look a little bit more about what the, the data tells us. Um, so, and Dr. Warren said it well, we have grand ideas and we know that there are things that, that don't work, um, but we also know in prevention, we rarely fund those things and we really plan in the front of them for some of the unintended consequences that may happen on the back. So, so the best examples I can think of in this are things like decriminalization for drug offenses. We know that we don't, we can't incarcerate ourselves out of a public health issue. And yet, when we decriminalize things, do we fund prevention, recovery, and treatment in a way that we know is going to be able to absorb the offset? Same thing when we legalize. We just heard about a 10-year-old with a medical marijuana card. I don't know that that was necessarily the intent of Oklahoma voters when they voted for the state question, but here we are. Did we plan for those exigencies in the first place? Did we put enough money? I mean, there is money tied from medical marijuana back into the prevention recovery treatment system. Not nearly enough. And we know that. We knew that before because some of our folks that have gone first in Colorado and Washington knew that they were spending four and a half dollars in addition to every dollar that they made to cover the public health costs of their legalization program. So we have these grand ideas and we know that they're public health positive in the long run if we can get them funded and if we can do them um, in a way that makes sense, um, but we often don't. And in this particular case, one of the things that we find is that while integrating classrooms and folks, as a former Head Start person, I am an advocate, a fierce, fierce advocate of having folks who are experiencing the challenges of a disability right alongside um, typically developing peers. Because I've seen the advantages, not just that it has for kids with a disability to be able to be with typically developing peers, but also the empathy and social emotional gains that typ typically developing peers gain from being um, in the same classroom. I'm an advocate of it. But as Dr. Warren said, it's a grand idea but if we don't fund IDEA and we don't give school districts enough resources to pull it off, then we set up an issue where what we see is this, right? Um, based on some research by Coco and, and Harper, while increasing deinstitutionalization and normalization had great similar or social effects 
like it increased access to sports facilities, schools and shops, but also at the same time to tobacco, alcohol and drugs. It increases the risk of misusing these substances, which can increase the likelihood of potential harm and addiction to all of those substances. Additionally, students with an intellectual disability tend to be more sensitive to peer pressure. They're poorly equipped to face high pressure situations and show inadequate self-regulatory behavior. So again, if we haven't prepped these students and we haven't prepped the systems that need to be able to support them well enough on the front end, then we end up with these instances where people who are more susceptible, and we'll talk about this later in some of the theory behind um, why the school piece happens, but we, we don't prep them in a way that means that they're able and have the safety net support system to deal with it. Um, we know that they're more likely to experiment at an earlier age because of this sort of uh, influence that they might have from peers that outstrips what a typically developing kid might. Um, we also know 75 to 85% of adolescents with an intellectual disability and severe behavioral problems who are admitted to treatment facilities show lifetime alcohol use on a regular basis. Um, so 25 to 50 of the uh, percent of these adolescents use drugs in particular cannabis on a regular or uh, on an occasional or regular basis. So we see all these different pieces that again, come from a grand idea. It's a good idea. It's something that we should advocate for, but we need to figure out how we can tweak the system. Now that we have what we have, how do we get what we know about prevention? and especially as it relates to substance misuse, how do we make those connections and try and create a sustainable system that better benefits everybody um, and can start to close in some of these gaps? Um, again, with you know, going back to some of the epidemiological side of this, one in three criminal legal system involved youth qualify for special education. That's over twice the rate observed in the general population. So they're they're twice as likely um, if they're in, in education based off the, the one in three criminal legal system involved. Most qualifying diagnoses for special education for youth in the juvenile justice system include, again, learning disability and emotional disturbance, are super high and in, in, along with intellectual disability. These are, you know, not necessarily the things that you can see or, or even understand when you look at a person, when I ask you to, to make a mental image of a person with a disability. Um, yet here we are, almost 40% for people with a learning disability, almost 47% of those folks um, are somewhere in the youth juvenile justice system. And once they've gotten there, going back to the, the idea of early intervention, now you're really talking about having to try and do indicated prevention or indicated recovery and treatment because they're already in some level of the juvenile justice system, which we know causes academic uh, performance to nosedive. And it means that they're more likely to end up in the adult um, justice system. So that was kind of a lot of data all at once. Um, and between the risk factors and the data that you see, here's, here's your chance. And we've, we've set some time aside for this. What are your thoughts on why people with disabilities are overrepresented in the criminal legal system? Drop them in. And we'll spend as much time as we need. I know this is kind of a big open-ended question, but what are your thoughts on why people with disabilities are overrepresented in the criminal criminal legal system. Mm, Darcy, because the world doesn't work for folks with disabilities. Yeah. Lack of adequate training in teachers, police, lawyers, healthcare professionals, et cetera. Police center are often the first point of inter intervention. That's a powerful point, Michael. A lot of times, especially when we see behaviors, behavioral disorders pop up, that is exactly right. Police end up being our first touch point for mental health um, in general. Many are not, are not diagnosed and they don't have, know they have a disability. Proper training again, 
People who don't understand IDD see them as dangerous. That's a great point. And that's one of those pieces that, that gets reinforced to us all too often in this sort of media cycle as well. Um, lack of understanding and services. That's not We've stigma been, also. Absolutely. Their needs are not met in schools and start feeling shame, isolation, depression, et cetera, may turn to substance use and other troubling behaviors. Lack of prevention in classrooms. Excellent. Absolutely. Those are the thoughts we need to start having. How do we get that to happen? How do we need to make that happen? Because a lack of prevention in classes and schools around the nation, free mental health resources, absolutely. Lack of legal representation, absolutely. Yeah, often you're talking about, and we're just about to get into that part, Derek, The you're talking about folks who are double or triple marginalized in many ways. So either low SES, Black or brown folks overrepresented, all of those things. Amen. Yes. All right. Good thoughts, everybody. Too many risk factors. Yes. All right. So I've been talking about this question all day long. <laughs> keep, keep teasing it, but let's just say it. I got a call from Derek and he said, hey, we, we've been talking about this over here. LaShawn and I have been having a conversation we think we want to do a service on the uh, special education to prison pipeline. And I said, what? I had that feeling. Uh, the bottom dropped out from under me. And again, I thought to myself, well, that sounds like a concept that's already out there. Why is it that I don't already know that and don't already know enough to think that I've worked on it as a preventionist? Because I sure have been working with populations that include those folks. So where have they been? I've had schools at the table, but did I really bother to make sure that somebody that represents special education was also there? Probably not sure that I did. So I, I had that moment. And, and it's like I said, I, I think in a lot of ways that in and of itself, and it's why I asked Eric's permission to talk about it today, that's part of being good in prevention is First of all, and importantly, taking time to have those conversations that Derek and LaShonda had. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time on our program, whether we're meeting the needs of our grant or the requirements of our grant, where we're trying to meet the needs of our community, but taking some intentional time to sit down and have some of those larger philosophical conversations about what are we missing? Just taking the time to ask that question. I mean, really, this is good prevention, even from a strategic prevention framework stance. In that moment, you're doing the thing where you're always evaluating, or you're always assessing. Are the things that we're doing working? Are we finding everybody? Is there somebody that we're missing? So they found somebody that they were missing, sure enough. And they called and said, we'd like to do a service on this. Will you help us? And then I reached out to two more people to pull them in because it obviously represented a, a big, big issue. So um, hey, again, Chuck, interest, yes. Oh, sorry. A lot of times, this is the first time that I've heard about the school to prison pipeline from the lens of substance use. It's often referenced speaking specifically to academic performance. So there are lots of indicators at third and fourth grade, if a student isn't reading at a particular level, they're going to continue to struggle in academics. It increases the rate of dropout, et cetera, et cetera. But putting the spin of that also puts them at risk of substance use was a, a new one on me also. Because eventually, that is the next piece of the cycle, right? They yeah. drop out, they get in whatever, and eventually substances come into play. And we know what we have done in the past with uh, substances in the court system. They end up going to, to prison instead of treatment and recovery. Essentially, every step along the way, we've, and somebody said that earlier, sort of deck, a, a stacked deck. So Mr. Newby, if you would, would you mind kind of shedding some light on the conversation that started this all and, and the school to prison pipeline from the substance use uh, lens? 
Well, it would be my honor. Uh, this has been a, a, a topic that I think um, is known and, and unknown at the same time. As preventionists, I remember when I took my certification uh, test, and one of the questions was, was in there about scenarios about accessibility and making sure, like if we were having a prevention meeting someplace that if it wasn't wheelchair accessible, then it wasn't completely accessible. We weren't being inclusive. But there were no questions on there about uh, any disabled students that were that had mental disabilities. Uh, it was just something that was just not on there. And I also, being in prevention for as, as, as long as, as I have, have had circumstances where we work with schools. But even then, it seems like when I look back and I think about it, and I want you to look back and think about it also, were we just looking for the best of the best? If we were doing billboards, were we just trying to get students that we thought represented the school in the best light? Because often that's what they put forward uh, toward us. So you see, when children receive corporal punishment in school or, or they're removed from school, they're less likely to be involved in programs like this. And in fact, if I ask you right now, uh, what do you think is more likely to happen to children who are separated from school? And you can put it in chat. Feel free to, to open openly share. I started out school at a Catholic school. They didn't put me out of school, but they did put a paddle to me multiple times for the exact same reason. I had uh, ADHD, but it wasn't diagnosed or treated with medication at that time. You just got a whooping. So the school to prison pipeline has been around for a long time. And just like Michelle uh, said, it's just been looked at in different lenses. And if all you do is look through one lens and say, uh, these are the students that are not performing well, and you don't go deeper or further upstream, then we seem to, to find ourselves in the situation that, that we are right in right now. So the school to prison pipeline is a common metaphor, if some of you are on here and, they haven't, and you haven't heard it. It's used to describe the ways in which students are pushed out of the education system and into the juvenile and criminal justice systems. But they're done, it's done through policies and it's done through practices within schools that involve law enforcement. This is a disturbing national trend where youth are funneled out of the public schools and into juvenile and criminal legal systems, sometimes under the guise of this is the best path for your child to the parents and parents voluntarily go along with it. You see, many of these youth are black or brown. They have disabilities or histories of poverty or abuse or neglect and would actually benefit from additional support and resources. But instead, they are isolated, punished, and pushed out. Has anybody, uh, you can put yes or no in there, ever heard of zero tolerance policies? Yes or no? Yes, yes, okay. This is one of those things essentially that has fueled the prison overpopulation problem that we have right now. Zero tolerance policies. We know for a fact, even our youth who have no mental challenges at all, may have behavioral issues. And with zero tolerance policies, it's very easily to, to criminalize minor infractions of school rules. While law enforcement is in the school, that also leads students to being criminalized for the behavior that should have normally been handled inside the school. Uh, when I was going to school, I had the, 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 the benefit of when uh, schools were being integrated. So I was going to a school that was the majority uh, was, uh, was white. And I was one of about five black students in that school. When I got into to trouble, my first thought coming from other schools was someone was gonna hit me or someone was gonna suspend me from school and I couldn't come anymore. But instead they had something that they call in-school suspension. Never heard of it before. 
but they took me to a separate classroom with other students who had misbehaved as well. And they brought me my work from every class that I would have normally had that day so I could still stay up to date with the work that I had to do for school. So I wouldn't get behind. Wow, I benefited from that. Uh, had that not happened, I'm sure I would have fallen behind. And I'm sure at some point I would have got frustrated. But because they chose to handle it within, within the school system and at the school, I was able to graduate on time. See, students of color are especially vulnerable to push out trends and in the discriminatory applications of, of discipline because school administrators have a, an incredible amount of discretion on how they use rules. Data from the US Department of Education, civil rights data collected illustrated that glaring discipline disparities are occurring at the intersection of race, disability, and gender. And during the 2013 to 2014 school year, 6% of all public school children experienced at least one out of school suspension. This figure doubles to 12% among children with disabilities. Let me say that for you again. This figure doubles to 12% among children with disabilities. Worse still, this figure doubles again till approximately one quarter of children for Black, Hispanic, multiracial, and American Indian Alaskan Native boys with disabilities. So we know that exclusionary discipline practices are associated with poor academic outcomes, but we also know that the benefits of keeping kids in school and engaged in education far outweigh any reason for excluding them from education. In fact, it puts them in the pipeline to prison. So uh, we had the, the benefit of as we develop this program of looking at some of the theoretical pathways for special education to, to prison pipeline, so we could better understand it. And thanks to the 2011 Breaking School Rules study, a longitudinal study for over 1 million Texas school children, we learned that students who receive a suspension or expulsion, expulsion are more likely to drop out or be retained in the same grade and enter the juvenile justice system than their peers which in itself is a risk factor that can contribute to substance misuse. You see, school failure and low commitment to school are risk factors, but they are the circumstances youth with poor impulse control face. But I wanna share a body of knowledge which you call this theoretical pathways for special education to prison pipeline, because based on these three theories and related research findings, we have outlined a, a conceptual framework to capture pathways by which you with special education needs get funneled into the justice system. So you can know what they are. You can identify them. Youth with mental, emotional, and behavioral problems in schools are at higher risk for engaging in problematic behaviors, such as early substance use and aggressive or violent behaviors that might lead to involvement in the juvenile justice system. But the pathways to the juvenile justice system for youth with, with these problems might also be mediated through either special education, referrals, identification, or uh, disciplinary processes. Knowing these theories will help you as a prevention professional because you can work with the schools to identify potential opportunities to intervene when youth are identified as special education needs. And as prevention professionals that are working to shape the future, it is also important to recognize that possibly some of the youth that you may have chosen not to work with in the past have unidentified needs for special education and needs for support and services more so than the general population. They, they may have been labeled as problem kids 
in school for receiving recurring disciplinary infractions and, and ultimately getting involved in the justice system. Should they have been included in your prevention programs? Are they the hidden population that missed services because they never had access due to their behavior? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about these three theories and ask ourselves those questions again. School failure theory, the susceptibility theory, and the differential treatment theory. First, we're gonna look at the school failure theory because it suggests uh, that these youth struggle academically, which increases their likelihood of leaving school for reasons like dropout or suspension or expulsion and subsequently engaging in delinquency. So essentially it's, it's sort of like their fault. This, this places the burden on the student. Now let's look at the outcome because as prevention professionals, we are tasked to, to, to prevent substance misuse. And youth that are expelled from school and do not receive educational services are often at risk for a number of negative outcomes, including substance misuse. These include lower academic achievement, a higher dropout rate. And when we look further downstream, uh, we see increased risk of unemployment, <clears throat> an increased risk of involvement in, in crime, and a decreased likelihood of pursuing post-secondary education. And even if they're able to avoid the pipeline to prison, these youth may struggle to find meaningful employment opportunities. and may experience a, a lack of social or emotional support. Those are the risk factors, again, for substance misuse. So when we look at the susceptibility theory, it, it says that the characteristics that accompany their disabling conditions, such as low impulse control or irritability <clears throat> and poor problem solving skills lead to delinquency. See, children are supposed to be protected under the IDEA. But in, Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act uh, includes other health impairments and specific learning disabilities. And its definition of a child with disability, uh, youth, who, uh, youth who receive special education services because of uh, other health impairments, which includes those with ADHD, emotional disturbances, and specific learning disabilities, because we know that they are more likely than general education students to experience symptoms associated with mental health disorders. But overall, compared to their peers who are not in the special education, students in special education exhibit significantly higher externalizing and internalizing behaviors, which are associated with psychopathology and mental health disorders. So students who with lower self-regulatory skills as reported by their teachers are more likely to be in special education and youth with lower self-regulation skills, both self-reported and reported by their parents are more likely to be arrested. Talk about self-regulation skills or, or goal-directed behaviors. Uh, they're necessary for academic and social success. And although these skills tend to be stable over time, self-regulation skills are amendable to change. But it takes intervention. Even with adolescents in high school or in the juvenile justice system, it takes intervention. This means we can help these youth before they end up in the prison. I mean, don't we have evidence-based programs that, that teach problem-solving skills? Yet, youth with disabilities continue to penetrate deeper into the juvenile justice system instead of receiving needed services, jeopardizing their future prospects of success.
And then there's the differential treatment theory. And this suggests that youth with disabilities who qualify for special education simply experience more punitive treatment because school and juvenile justice systems, uh, because it's just, it's a normalized process. And it, it's just gonna happen. It's gonna happen at a higher rate than their counterparts. See, youth are people. And when people come to identify themselves and others to reflect how others label them, or stereotype them, they lose their power. This theory can be applied to the school to prison pipeline because by being labeled a bad kid by those in authority and then being treated to fit the role, our youth and their families easily accept the harsh treatment. Using 2004, uh, 2005 data, not previously published, we found that in the United States, there are now more than three times more seriously mental ill persons in the jail and prison than in hospitals. Three, four states, a jail or prison holds more mentally ill individuals than the largest remaining state psychiatric hospital. And in every county in the United States with both a county jail and a county psychiatric facility, more seriously mental ill individuals are incarcerated been hospitalized. So instead of asking, what are they locked up for? We have to start learning these theories so we can start redirecting the youth early. See, once youth engage with the youth probation system after being labeled as a bad kid, their risks of ending up in prison for mental health treatment rather than with a school counselor significantly increase. And people in prison get treatment, but that's way downstream. Justice involve youth facing an increased likelihood of life adversities, including their risk of substance misuse. And exponentially, it increases when they enter prison. So this is why Chuck and I have all of you together today. We have to triangulate this issue because we all have unique perspectives and we all have resources that can be used to fix the problem upstream if we work together. And I wanna ask you, uh, Chuck, have you seen any recent examples of this in the news and can you share them with everyone today? Absolutely, and thank you for that, uh, Derek. The, I mean, again, laying out the theoretical pathways and when we, when we talk about the actual impact, again, it can be, you know, if you're removed from it, if you don't see it, maybe you don't know. Um, but it was interesting once the question was asked, this kind of stuff started popping up all the time. Garrick and I were sharing articles back and forth about different things that were happening. There was a, an article in the New York Times about a practice that I was completely unaware of um, uh, that is called an informal removal in a school. So they had a couple of different students who had been a, a part of this process. Um, and in fact, in a, in a report last year, National Disability Rights Network, um, a nonprofit established by con Congress more than four decades ago, found that informal removals were occurring in hundreds and perhaps thousands of times per year as an off the book suspension. So in these off uh, the book suspensions, these sort of informal removals, the student that was featured in the article had started relatively normal. Normally he had a processing disability because of a gene deletion disability that he suffers from. Um, when he got to second grade, there was a, a teacher and his outbursts and whatever were not tolerated. And he says in the article, that was the year that he stopped liking school. He eventually regressed to a kindergarten reading level. And by third grade, that was the last time he attended a full day of school until he was 15 years old. Um, there, were, there was a point where, uh, in the middle of all that, where he might have been going to school for one hour a day. Um, and, and that was it. There's another story in there relating um, to the increase 
that we see in students of color who experience discipline at a higher rate. Um, the great article, it's in the chat. If you would like to read it, I highly suggest it because these are the policies that we need to start to look at um, as prevention is that's one of the places, you know, we've already talked about maybe even on a federal level, changing IDEA, so it includes substance use disorder, but policies, those sort of top level environmental things, that's one of the places that I really feel that we can help. Um, you know, one of the other uh, stories that we came across, unfortunately, shake my head, but it came from my home state. Uh, it took us two tries to pass a bill um, that protected students who were in special education from being paddled or receiving corporal punishment in schools. Still legal in Oklahoma, doesn't always happen often, but schools are able to, to, to perform corporal punishment. And up until this year, they were able to do it on students who were in special education. Um, the lawmaker that proposed that bill um, actually is a, a person who has ADHD. And he talked about the fact that one of the reasons that he uh, proposed it was he got hit a lot in school um, because he acted out because of his ADHD and he wanted to try and fix it. The first time that bill came up, a bill which you might think would be an absolute no brainer, it did not pass. It got a lot of national news because it did not pass. In fact, it failed rather, rather stunningly, but not enough it was able to send it back to, to committee. They re reworked it and they finally did get it passed. The fact that until this year it was possible and the fact that it took two tries says something about where we're at. And a lot of, I've seen a lot of comments in the chat that I think I absolutely agree with people just not understanding or, or really being empathetic with some of the challenges and struggles. And again, that's one of the pieces that we're going to hope to talk about in the second um, round of this. But the other thing I wanted to tie one, one bow around all three of these theoretical pathways. Um, we love risk, risk and, and protective factors. One of the biggest protective factors for any adolescent is school connectedness. And this has been proven over and over again. There was a sort of pioneering paper on it by Dr. Robert Bloom that talked about all of the different behaviors that a strong sense of school connectedness um, protects students again. And, it, and it's amazing. And, and importantly, and this is one of those places as we start to think about where prevention can have an impact, it doesn't have to be a teacher. It can be somebody who works in the school, the front office person, the janitor, an aide, even the parent comes in that comes in and, and helps. But if a student can say they feel a strong connection to at least one adult in the school and they feel a strong connection to school, they are insulated against all sorts of things. Um, in fact, so defined as students' experience of belonging to and closeness with others at the school, so specifically with others, not just the school itself, research suggests that school connectedness is associated with fewer adolescent externalizing problems, including violence, alcohol use, cigarette and marijuana use, onset of sexual activity, destroying other people's properties and running away from home, and those are just a few, because there's more on that list. The thing that all three of these do is disrupt that process. If you are suspended, you cannot form connection to your school. If you are treated harsher and it becomes a bad place, you cannot form a connection to your school. We need at some point to help work on that. And that is one of those places that I feel that prevention can definitely have an impact if we start to, to figure out how um, to expand our, our horizons. So there's a question in the chat. This is the power of the room. Um, and yes, uh, the articles are, should be in the chat. Derek, is that correct? Or in the, the slide deck? We've got a request to share the article. Oh, they're in the references. Yeah, they are in the references. Um, so chat question, what can prevention professionals do? We've already talked about some pieces of this. We do what we do, right? We know how to look at policy. We know how to dig and research and figure out what's evidence-based, what might have an impact. We know how to reach out and create community collaborations and connections. We know some of these things. One of the things that occurred to me pretty early on um, when we started to talk about this, the thing that came into my head 
with the idea of triangulation and I don't want to explain anything, but I'll just say it how it happened with me. I was at, at forestry camp as a kid when they were talking about fire towers, right? And the way that they spot where a forest fire is, is they have at least three towers and you draw a big circle around mine. I can, I look out at my horizon and I can see there's a fire 20 miles from me. So I draw a big circle 20 miles with my towers and epicenter. And then two other uh, towers do that. And as long as they can see the fire, as long as it's within their view and their horizon, where those three circles intersect, you know exactly where your fire is. You can coordinate it. You can go and fight it. You can fix it. But until those circles connect, folks, and if you look at the slide that we've got here, that's where your cracks are. When we talk about people slipping through the cracks, that little donut hole in the middle where it says opportunities for collaboration, that's where it is. Prevention has to find a way to expand our circle because here's what we know. By virtue of the fact of the way that this all works, families and education are already relatively connected. Families send their kids to school. There's an entire process for IEPs. And like I said, even before that in Oklahoma, IFSPs that start before kids are school age. These two segments, and we'll talk about family in just a minute, but these two segments are pretty joined. They have to work with each other, not always as efficiently and as effectively as maybe they could, but that's a pre-existing relationship. We also know that prevention works with education, right? In Oklahoma, we have an entire school-based part of prevention. Dr. Warren's part of it um, that our Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services is doing. They use these broad sectors. So I uh, work in community-based prevention. Dr. Warren works in schools and we have a chance to collaborate. So there's a connection that way. And we know we work with families because families are part of our community. We want them in our coalitions. Our job is to try and build that tower, our fire tower even higher so that our bubble gets big enough that we've got overlap with both. And if we can do that, then we can start to figure out some places where we might be able to either, if interventions don't exist, we might be able to work, figure out interventions that we can design that are based on evidence-based programs. But at the end of the day, when we fly prevention in here, that's really our work to do. We need to try and expand that bubble and get it so that it overlaps and fills that void where we know there are people slipping through the cracks right now. So again, throwing it back to the room, what strategies and approaches is, practices do you already use when you're working with students with an intellectual or emotional disabilities right now? You can throw those in the chat. And if you don't use any, it's okay. You can say that. I don't use any right now. That is also absolutely acceptable because I think that's, again, one of the reasons that we find ourselves here. I need to find some. <laughs> and that is one of the things that, that session two will largely be about. Um, we'll start to look at at least a couple of different really promising practices. Um, there we go. First person language and compassion patients, absolutely compassion twice, huge. Empathy, patience, empathy, uh, sensing a theme. <laughs> and it's absolutely right. Educate, supply information. I tend to slow down, ask a lot of clarifying questions. Can you tell me what you're having trouble with? Absolutely. And also all of these are really good, not just a lot of these are like interpersonal communication, right? Having empathy, but it works across the board. And I think the empathy word that keeps coming up is huge. That's one of the reasons why I felt like it was so uh, just vital in the beginning of this to reach out and ask the question. That's like I said, you're going to hear from, from Melinda in the second one, a mom of a, a kiddo that's, that has a disability. She certainly doesn't speak for everyone who has one, but it was important for me to hear her story and understand it so that I could empathize. Because sympathy is where you feel sorry for somebody. Empathy is where you get, dig in and you try and walk a mile in their shoes and understand. It. Um, so I, I absolutely think that's huge. The empathy word that, that comes up, I love that. Um, what I do is to be being careful with the topic approach, 
give options for group work, not to mandate it, keep discussion easy to understand. Absolutely. Person first, playing language, lots of formats to disseminate information, ask the person to put in their own words. Love all these. Love all these. These are great for those interpersonal communication approaches that you're going to use. Um, amazing. So let's let's talk about it. The community approach preventionists, we use this all the time, right? And we are one of the 13 sectors. We are a vital part of being in the room. That is one of my big soapboxes that I'll get on. We talk a lot about sustainability and we talk a lot about building these community coalitions and community groups in a way that they can carry on without us. But we need to recognize that you have value as the person in the room who understands prevention. Sustainability is not about creating these without us. It's about finding ways to hardwire us in so that we can be part of the process, so we can be in the room, helping to be the engine um, that guides us. You know, I've compared this before of like, when we build these sometimes, thinking about it without the prevention professional in the room is like building a car with no engine. That's really what we do is help drive the process and make sure that it stays evidence-based and that it stays on practice. But one thing that I want to point out in this, and again, some of this comes back to one of the central questions when we started talking about students with disabilities. In your coalitions, in this community approach where we want to get community sectors and all the different people at the table, you can have schools at the table. In fact, you could say, listen, I've got the president of the PTA at the table. I've got schools at the table. Of course I do. They're represented. But schools are big, big organizations, right? They're these huge, complex systems. And sometimes, and I think this gets back to what Derek was saying, even in our own work, even in our own prevention work, when we were trying to get policies passed by having kids go and present to a city council or a school board meeting, were we making sure that there was somebody represented that had a disability? Did it even cross our mind to think through that part of it? So just because you have a parent doesn't necessarily mean that that parent's child is experiencing what some of the ones that we've talked about today are. It's important to keep looking for those hidden populations. And even when you think you've got the people at the table, your community approach that you need, keep asking questions. Keep finding those places that you can invite somebody further that has a different experience than, you know, not all law enforcement officers a school resource officer is likely to have a different sort of mindset than somebody who's worked narcotics for their entire career. Um, and maybe you need both. But one of the things that's not on here, and I talk about it only because it's been in our slides a couple of different times, and it's something that I want to alert people to, again, from a prevention and a potential for us to do some work um, and, and also to identify another hidden population. Can anybody think of a word that we've used a bunch today that is not represented in our community approach, a, an entire sector. And there's a reason for this. It's kind of interesting. Again, a shout out to one of my former professors, Dr. Henderson, because she used to talk about this all the time. Any guesses in the chat? I mean, there's probably lots of sectors that aren't there. You're getting at it, princess. Who lives at home? That's exactly it. There it is. Love that. Love it. Family. Because as it turns out, family is either not in most of our founding documents or ill-defined in many others. We don't have good working definition of what that means. And we have never given good full protection and support and safety net sort of services to family because we don't, we say that it's important. We talk about family all the time, but because it's not defined and it's not often part explicitly in language of law and policy, it often gets overlooked. And again, that's one of the reasons that we included it as one of the triangulation pieces. Obviously, families are at the table because we're all part of the family, whether it's combined, grandparents raising kids, traditional, whether it's a found family, um, you know, those kinds of things all matter. And those are the at-home uh, 
the folks that have sat home, that's where kids are spending the other eight hours of their day that they're not at school or 16 hours, whatever it ends up being. Um, and if we're not finding ways to incorporate that in an intentional way, not just, of course, we work with families. They're there because everybody's there. Um, if we're not finding intentional ways to, to fit that in, that's one of the places that prevention can help. Again, we've talked about this a bit, but prioritizing representation and diversity, keep asking those questions, selecting the most robust engagement strategy possible. This gets back to our evidence base. We know how to do this, right? If we look at the places that we know that we can intervene, once those circles overlap, that's where the work of prevention really proves its, its worth because that's what we're good at. Encouraging decisions to emerge from local contexts and practices, sharing strength and capacities through formal par partnerships. So if we don't have formal partnerships with schools, if we don't have you know, family rec representation, there are, there are family networks in states that represent families. If you don't have partnerships, reach out and make those. That's a lot and a little bit of time. I'll hand it back to you, Mr. Newby, to, to close this out and, and ask the questions, but this is the time for you all, if there's something that we didn't cover, to hit us with it. And keep in mind, there will be part two. Thank you. And so thank much. you. That was very inspirational. And uh, I hope everyone here uh, did answer one of your questions. Please feel free to put them in the chat now. If we don't get to it today before we end, we will save these questions and we will uh, make sure that they're answered in part two. So uh, if you have any questions that are really egging you on right now, if you really want to get out, here's the time to ask it. And as I said before, even if we don't get the answer all up today, we will have the answers in part two. Hey, I see, thank you. I see this was informative. That is my signal to thank yous again. That is definitely my signal, Wanda, to move on to the next slide. So. Uh, uh, next time for part two, uh, we will have uh, substance misuse among students with disabilities, guidance for prevention professionals. And that's going to be on May 18th, 2023, from 2.30 to 4 o'clock p.m. So same uh, bat time, same bat channel. Uh, if you have not registered for it yet, uh, you were provided a link early on by, uh, by Wanda for you to click on and you could have registered today, uh, but registration will remain open. I encourage you to register as soon as possible so you can be a part of, of uh, finding the solutions in, in part two. Truly enjoyed this opportunity. If any questions come to you uh, afterwards that you would like to, to share with us, this is my contact information, DL Newby at, oh, oh, I got that wrong. Sorry about that. It's dlnewby at ou.edu. You don't have to put the email in there. It's dlnewby at ou.edu, and I'll put that in the in the, the chat for you as well. Okay. You can also come to our website, South Southwest PTTC. Encourage you when you come there to join our mailing list and also put yourself on our list to receive products and resources in the future as well. But we are just a, a click away from you to help you build your capacity as a PTTC. That is our um, one of our, our driving goals is helping people in states that are working in prevention, especially at the state level, go to that next level. We provide the technical assistance that's needed upon requests. We have regular programs. And then we also, uh, we share information as it says in our title, the Prevention Technology Transfer Center. We are transferring knowledge from our level to yours so that you can be successful in your states in helping to make changes and move prevention forward. You will receive a, a copy of this slide deck. It does have the references. Uh, so you'll have access to this whole slide and a recording of today's presentation. So you'll have everything that you need. And with that said, our time has come to an end. And I thank you all for spending this time with me today. It's time for my team. Special thanks goes out to my whole team with uh, uh, Richard and Lori and Wanda 
and special thanks to, to Chuck Lester uh, for being here with us today as well uh, to help us with this issue. And we look forward to seeing you next time. How many people, just a quick poll, plan on coming to the, the next session? You can put a yes in there or a no. I do. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. I love it. Well, feel free to contact us so that we can help in the in the future. And we'll see you next time.